So this is a very controversial topic. I always get very mixed feelings after the topic, like people like it and people don't. But you know, this is a this is a talk that I was inspired because you know we had this issue, and I I thought it was you know necessary for me to share this with people so people can make their own choices. Uh, but before talking about it, I'm just going to introduce myself. Um, uh, I'm Antonio Chavez, as you know, th Tom already mentioned. I'm a senior software engineer. Um, that's my Twitter. That's my GitHub. If you want to give me a shout or you know star me or whatever, that'll be cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I've, I've been doing Ruby on Rails for the last seven years. Uh, that's basically the programming language where, or you know, the framework that we use at Q for the platform. And um, I work remotely usually. I, you know, I, I, I'm I'm coming from Mexico. Actually, I, I flew from Guadalajara yesterday. Um, so I work remotely like 90% of the time, and some other time I spend in San Francisco or whatever, whenever, whenever they need me. And um, so I'm also, so as previously mentioned, I'm the co-founder and technical leader of uh, Q Technologies. And I also help uh, this company called Tango Source as a, um, as a consultant. Uh, th that's a very good uh, software boutique that you can go to if you need uh, someone to help you, you know, build your project. Um, and again, so I come from a small town called Colima, which, uh, which is, you know, the fourth smallest state in the country. Nobody has ever heard of Colima before, at least not here. Um, but it's great. It's a beautiful state. It's two hours away from the Guadalajara airport, so I had to drive all the way up to the airport to take the plane to Austin. But, you know, it's, it's great. It has the smallest population in the country, and, but it has one of the highest standards of living. And uh, it's great. So we have, you know, great parks. This is a uh, picture of the main plaza in downtown, Colima. We have archaeological places. That's a big space called La Campana, which which means the bell in English. And uh, it's it's uh, huge, and it has a lot of pyramids and tombs and stuff like that. And this is a picture of the city. Uh, there's two things you can notice here. The first one is that there's no tall buildings, and that's because we live in a hazard zone of uh, earthquakes. So it's basically um, forbidden to build uh, buildings more than three stories tall. So that's that's basically it. And on the uh, you know on the background you can see two mountains, and both are volcanoes. And this is a picture of one of them, actually. So that's that's kind of cool. This is a picture that won the third place in the World Press Photo Contest. Uh, the guy is called Sergio Tapiro, which is a very good photographer. He has been taking pictures of the volcano for the last. Um, 20 years, and you know he got right this one, and he won a contest. And we have great communities. Um, so this talk, this there's Codificadas, which is women who code, Thinking Couch, Comita Max, Tech for Good, Web Dev Talks. This talk actually started there on the last one on Web Dev Talks, and uh, I thought it was uh, good enough for a conference. So here I am. Um, so before we before I get started, I would like to give you a heads up and what this talk is not about. This talk is not about MongoDB is dead. All right, so let's get that out of the way first. And this talk is not to persuade you to stop using MongoDB. All right, and this talk is also not about why MongoDB sucks. So I'm, you know, it, because it's basically kind of like the sense that I get from people, like I'm saying that, but I'm not, I'm just, you know, I'm just explaining why MongoDB did not work out for us, right? And um, yeah, I'm just gonna explain the case. I'm gonna be explaining the case and why we decided to leave MongoDB for good almost a year ago, and how that has been working for us. So, but initially, I have to admit that this call was this talk was called "Why I Hate MongoDB," but after a lot of thought, when I you know cooled down and you know I was calm enough, I you know said. You know, it's not that I hate MongoDB. It's that, you know, MongoDB did not work out for us. So, you know, that's basically the background for this talk. Um, because it, turn, it turns out MongoDB is not a relational database, and we didn't know that at some point. Um, but yeah, it has its application, but Q was definitely not one of them. Um, yeah, so we've been... I want to introduce a little bit about what Q does, just so you have a, a little bit of more background in what 
work, the schema and how that works and why it didn't fit for us. Um, so we, are, we build a set of tools that you can embed into your website so you can create contests and you can have people join your campaigns and stuff like that. So it has worked out for you know, um, promoting, you know, sharing, growing your user base by you know, rewarding people for sharing your product or your platform or you know, your raising awareness of your brand. And, um, and yeah, we have a lot of activities that users can do and they, give points back, they get points back and you know, the winner gets X, Y, and Z uh, thing, right? That's provided by the brand. We do not provide that. Um, and uh, this is one of the campaigns that we run. This is uh, Father.io, which is a uh, augmented reality uh, first person shooter. Uh, that it's basically, they, they were able to get 650% funded on Indiegogo after using our tools for their campaign. And they, they basically did that. We did not build it, we're not that smart. Um, but yeah, that's one of the campaigns. And this is an example of uh, the widget that we offer for your website. Um, so it has three parts. The first part is kind of like the position bar, what we call the position bar, where you can see yourself around the whole community that is uh, you know, signing up on your website. Uh, there's activity buttons on the top, uh, or uh, on the bottom of the uh, position bar for sharing, posting, sending an email, uh, custom link that you can copy and paste into your website or in, in, in Facebook, Twitter, or whatever. And, um, and we uh, the, the third part is what we call the community part, where you can see the people around you. If you switch to the other tab, you're gonna see your friends from Facebook or the people that you have referred. So that's, that's also cool. cool. And it's, uh, we have, uh, it's very simple to embed. We have just one SDK that you can embed into your website and you just copy and paste two, two lines of code and that's it. You, you get all the features that we have. All right, so I wanna go back to 2013, which is the year where Q was found. Um, and during those years, you know, I was working at this outsourcing company called Tango Source. And um, one of the things that we noticed back then is that we had more and more requests from clients to either switch to MongoDB their databases or start new projects using MongoDB because it was the hot, the hot thing back then. And um, there was no other explanation, uh, at least for a few customers, but that, you know, just because they wanted to use something cool and shiny, right? And um, I joined Q in 2014, uh, so that's a year after the company was found, founded. Uh, I was w working as a consultant. They came in as a project, as I mentioned. They came in with a MongoDB database. And uh, by the end of the year, I joined um, as a partner in the company full time to build the second phase of the platform, which is the widget that I showed previously. But Q in 2013 was something completely different. Um, so when I got started writing features for the platform, the, co the code was already legacy from previous developers. So the, all the developers, uh, so the, the decisions in terms of the architecture were already made. So I was there, I got these tools, and you know I had to work with them, which was basically the, a Rails application with MongoDB for database, for persistence, and Redis for caching, some caching and queuing. And you know we were about to see, we were about to build the second phase of the platform, so we figured out, you know, that's good enough for us. So let's just carry on developing software, and, but then we didn't know what problems we were gonna encounter, right? So we didn't have a strong user base to kind of have like proof that our system was scalable. So that meme represents basically what happened to us. And um, so yeah, we still didn't, haven't run any big campaigns on it before. So this was our basic structure for the collections from the database. It doesn't look very Mongo-like if, if you think about it for a moment. We have products, uh, which are the campaigns. Uh, we have positions, which is your position relative to the campaign. And we have users, right? And they are associated with each other using foreign keys. So user, you know, position has a product ID and has a user ID so we can correlate the information between the campaign and the user, right? Because obviously we want users to be able to join multi multiple campaigns and not repeat ourselves, right? Or not repeat data. Um, but uh, 
If we follow the basic principles of Mongo design, uh, MongoDB design, um, the best way to go, or at least the best way we, we, were, we were told we should go, was to using embedded collections, right? So we had the products, we had the rewards, which are also the prices that we give for the users, and the positions, the comment, name, and email, and that's an array, or that's a, a collection of documents inside of uh, the products collection. And we can get all the data with just one query, so cool. So we can reduce the amount of calls that we do to the database. However, what would happen if we had hundreds of thousands of users sign up into a single campaign? Because remember, this is a viral product, or this is, this is shooting to increase virality for brands. And um, investigating on the web about MongoDB, nobody really mentions anything about limits for, the, for embedded documents, or at least I couldn't find anything back then. I guess, you know, for now it's better, but you know, back then it wasn't documented, or it wasn't you know, obvious you know, if there was a certain limit for it. And um, we hit a wall pretty hard. So this is metrics, but you know, that was basically what, what was happening. We were using Heroku as our, as, you know, as our, as our platform for serving the application. And we basically, if you observe, we see the orange part, which is MongoDB, you know, being the biggest part, as well as the GC execution, which was you know, the garbage collection working to get rid of all the old objects, right? But the issue, we see also requ request queuing, which is the green part there, growing up because this, you know, we didn't have enough servers to serve all the requests coming in, and if we increased to like, I don't know, like 30 dynos, that wasn't improving. So it wasn't about the amount of uh, horizontal scalability, it was about the database because it was the biggest chunk that we could observe there. And then later on, we found out that investigating in the darkest corners of MongoDB's documentation, the document size limit is 16 megabytes. And obviously, you know, I think I should have known that before, right? Um, yeah, and obviously 16 megabytes for a document, it's kind of big if you wanna, you know, send that document through a network to a server, right? It's gonna increase latency. It's obvious that it's go that's gonna happen. But that 16 megabyte just gave us 100 users per campaign. So, and you might say it's, it's our fault because we designed our collections poorly, but, and you might be right, but the issue here is that when we search for best practices in MongoDB forums, everybody talk about embedded collections. How you should use embedded collections for you know, associating data so you can improve the performance of your queries. And these eventually ended up backfiring us. And um, but yeah, and nobody mentions any, any limits or anything like that. And if you see, you know, 100 users per, cap per campaign is very low, so it's very limited amount of people that we can have for a brand, so this is not useful at all. So we came back to the other model. So we have, you know, three different collections. They're not embedded. We have positions, users, and products. There we go. So this is the initial way we thought about it if it was a relational database. Um, and that worked out. So we were able to solve the issue that way and we had the users being able to you know, join campaigns and interact with each other without any particular issue. So the pace was really, really good. And uh, so we were able to grow our user base. But now, and you know, it's time to generate metrics for customers. Woo. So, on the campaign management side, we have a lot of different tools, but this, this is the one that you know, was more compelling for the customer. They, we, they wanted to be able to see how the user base grew over time. And um, this is a campaign called Liberty Trike that, goes, that got almost 200% of viral lift because of our tools. If you see the gray area is kind of like the users that are coming organically, and the purple area is the ones that we're providing on the referring actions. And, um, and this one was generating every time you refresh your browser. So if you were there and you know, click refresh, the metrics were crunch, we're gonna crunch right there and you're gonna see the graph with the latest data. But you know, that meant uh, we had to use something like MapReduce 
in order to be able to you know, build the, the metrics and all that. So again, that's the graph that we're trying to build. Um, so later on, so MapReduce is a very complex tool to use. So you know, it was kind of hard to read the code. And we found that there was a, a thing called the aggregation framework. And so we used that for improving the queries. And uh, eventually, we found out that the aggregation framework is just a framework in, on top of MapReduce. And that, that was basically the same thing, but prettier, right? And um, as what we noticed here is that as the user base uh, grew, the time spent in the server crunching the data grew as well, right? So, so again, aggregation framework uses MapReduce internally. And this was really impacting our performance. That meant that for 3,000 users or for 3,000 documents in the users on the positions collection, it took around 30 seconds to, 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 to build, right? Uh, so that was really impacting the performance of our application because, you know, obviously you go to the dashboard, hit refresh, and if you get a response in 30 seconds, that's really, really bad experience. So we introduced uh, Sidekick, which is basically, uh, if you're not familiar with Rails, is a background processing tool that allows you to run jobs in a separate process. So you can delegate the data, the data processing to something else and use your web browser just to serve in web requests and not doing any data crunching. But that meant that we were able to time or to benchmark the amount of time spent on each campaign for generating the metrics. And for the campaign that I showed you in the beginning, the Father I.O. campaign, which had uh, uh, 300,000 users, that took an hour to, to build. So that was very, very bad. And um, you know, initially, we had a pace of five minutes for all the campaigns to be building the metrics. But eventually, you know, those five minutes were not enough because you know, since this took an hour to, to crunch, then there was going to be a lot of different jobs running at the same time for the same campaign. And they were all you know, building and building. And we were not able to deliver any fresh metrics to anybody. And that was not good at all. So I questioned myself, where's MongoDB's performance? And um, remember, this app has two parts, the widget side and the metric side. And uh, for the widget, it was good for people to be able to join a campaign, share, and do everything else. Everything was good. But when, we, when it came down to building metrics, we had a lot of issues. And you know, at some point, we reduced the pace of calculating the metrics or the crunching the data to every three hours. And that was not. Um, what we really wanted to for the users or for the managers, for account managers. And uh, I came to this conclusion. MongoDB is fantastic for doing simple operations. If you are reading and writing into the MongoDB's database, it's incredibly fast. You don't even need to put a cache in your web browser or your web server because MongoDB reads and writes really, really, really fast. And that's because MongoDB like writes the records in memory first and then you know, writes to the disk, which is kind of like what Redis does. And um, so yeah, that makes read and write operations insanely fast. But you know, this was basically the, the killer thing for us in order to get rid of MongoDB for good. Mm, and you know, we spent most of our time putting out fires. That, that was basically it. So we were constantly getting you know, performance issues from, from the database. And uh, we had to uh, switch to something else. And for us, that flexibility, because basically the premise of MongoDB is that you, don't, you can get started quickly with the development without maintaining a schema. But eventually, that flexibility that you know, MongoDB offers uh, start, started having a cost for us. So now uh, we decided to move back to SQL. We decided to move back to relational database. and. Um, and we had enough of MongoDB, so we were investigating the alternatives. And uh, the, you know, that's, those are the databases that we were considering. And eventually, you know, we found out that you know, at the same time that we were trying to get out of MongoDB, we also wanted to get out of Heroku so to, and move to Amazon AWS. So we decided that it might, have, it might be a good idea to check out a database that was compatible with uh, uh, Amazon Aurora, which is basically a, a very good uh, database solution for, you know, database of 
of terabytes. Uh, so using MySQL was kind of like the decision for the future, right? So Aurora is a drop-in replacement for MySQL. You don't have to change any kind of line of code if you want to switch to that on your production servers. So yeah, I want to talk about a little bit of the migration process that we did. In this particular case, we wanted to create a process that could dump the MongoDB database into SQL sentences. So we wrote a tool using Node.js, which is, you know, we had a, 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 a set of libraries that basically allowed us to declare on a class using ES6 um, the, the names of the fields and the name of the collection. And what that would do is just pick that out and transform that into SQL. And um, here's basically, that's all the, that's, that's a full line of just one collection. So we have, uh, it, loads the, it loads the data as CSV because, uh, you know, MySQL doesn't have a copy function like Postgres do. And um, we write the data into a CSV and then we load it in a SQL sentence and then we insert all of that into the, into the data table. And we run the script, that's pretty straightforward. Um, so that was the amount of collections that we have, that we had for the project. So the, the list, there's a folder called data and all those are the CSV files for each database collection. And the dump SQL was the one that was able to uh, insert all that. And this is the command to insert them. So we call the production database on AWS and we just pass the SQL file and that's gonna do the trick. So now the stack would look more like this. So we still had the Rails application. We still had Redis for queuing. Now we had MySQL and we had to add, you know, memcached to cache some of the parts, some of the API responses that were similar on each request. So it really felt like that. So, oh my God. So we're back to SQL, yeah. And right out of the box, after doing that change, we had um, an average response time that went down from 100, 150 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds, which, remember, we're using Rails. Uh, in Rails, that's kind of like light years, basically. Um, so it was very good. It was three times faster. So that, that, that was also, you know, I'm not saying that that's all MongoDB's fault. That's, you know, that's with the help of, uh, AWS as well, because it has much better performance. We were using Elastic Beanstalk, which is kind of like the Heroku for AWS. So that was kind of cool. So I, I don't really have to spend time doing operations. I just you know do EB deploy, and they take care of the scaling. They take care of everything else, the deployment process and everything. So that was kind of cool. And the, process, the report that we were running for Father.io, which is uh, 300,000 records, uh, went down from one hour to 40 seconds which it's 90 times faster. And basically what we did is we just really translated the syntax from Mongo to SQL without doing any improvement. We're not using SQL views. We're not using any triggers, processes, or anything that it's you know, database related. We just did a translation of what we had from MongoDB into SQL, which means that we have a lot of room of improvement. And uh, and it's been over a year since we left MongoDB for good, and I can tell you for sure that uh, we haven't had any scalability issues since then, at least not database related. So what, I'm, what I wanna talk about right now is uh, the cost behind the decisions that we make every day. So because as, as developers, uh, you know, on a daily basis, you know, when we have a feature request from a customer, from our boss, from the project manager, or from whomever, what we do is just basically take that and pick some technologies to build it and put it on production, or you know, put it, develop, develop it and put it on production, right? So, in this particular case, in the case of MongoDB, um, I had the evidence that the database was the issue, but I had very little proof that SQL would fix it. Why is that? Because there was definitely more options on the NoSQL space that I could have used to fix the issue. But I had to follow my intuition and by observing how we were structuring the collections, I found out that you know, it was more reasonable to 
go back to SQL rather than moving out of Mongo MongoDB to use, I don't know, CouchDB, Cassandra, Hadoop, or whatever other NoSQL solution out there. And it worked out good for us. But the point that I want to make is saying something as simple as let's use MongoDB in 2000, 2013, um, it, it became an issue, or it became an issue for the last three years for us, or for three years or four years for us. So picking the wrong tools or the wrong technology for, the, for, for your project, for your company, can become a, a financial issue as well. And for us, it was roughly a year of, of setback on development. Because again, we started the development of the platform in 2013, I joined 2014, and in 2015, I started, we started the pilots for the campaigns. And the issue in 2015, or all, 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 the, all what I did in 2015 was just putting out fires, basically. But anyway, so I want to get to the conclusions. So, even though I'm, I'm going to contradict myself a little bit here, but I don't think there's anything wrong on testing new shiny tools. But um, at least here, the lessons that I learned is that you know I, I, we should be very, very careful. At least if you're doing uh, on your daily job those decisions to test new tools, and uh, if you want, if you have. Uh, if you want to solve a persistent a persistence issue, it's better to trust SQL rather than you know use a, a NoSQL database. That's just my opinion. I'm not saying that's 100% true. And the other thing is that if you're designing an application and you choose MongoDB for your database and you start thinking about collections associations, then that's the first indicator that you make the wrong choice. And you should go back to SQL, or you should go back to a relational database solution. And the last thing is, uh, like they say, you don't know what you have until it's gone. And in this particular case, you really don't value the power of a join until you're not able to do it. <laughs> so in my opinion, you know, I'm, I'm more of a SQL guy now, right? Um, and that's all I got. Thank you. I want to thank Compose and uh, for being able to 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 accept me for this talk. Thank you. <laughs>